now pass uh, to uh, Professor uh, Pazarji, um, who is a professor of international law at the law faculty of the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens and director of the Anthes Public International Law Center at the Faculty of Law. Um, she's also um, the chair of the Human Rights Committee and the president of the European Society of International Law. It is a great honor to have you with us, uh, Professor Pazadzis, and uh, I give you the floor. Thank you. If you can open your microphone. Thank you, Professor Bergandis. Thanks, Vasily. I guess you will be on uh, the panel now, so you will have to switch hats. Uh, greetings, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's very good to be with you. And uh, I do want to thank the organizers for uh, this invitation to chair in um, a panel of this um, today's conference on EU responsibility in the international legal system. Of course, I will thank Vasilis, but uh, also I would like to extend my warmest and best wishes to Professor Kaliopi Kufa, who um, I saw in the beginning of the session. I think uh, she might be uh, uh, with us from the Kufa Foundation. And so I extend her, her to her greetings from Athens. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I imagine we're, we're moving uh, quickly because time is uh, flying. But now uh, the, this panel uh, that uh, I have the honor to chair will be, I guess, returning back to some questions uh, around the Lex Generalis, Lex Specialis uh, discussion that was also held earlier. Uh, the, the panel uh, comes back to EU responsibility in the international system, but looking into the rules of the organization uh, in relation to special regimes. So uh, I see from the papers, we will be discussing issues of international uh, economic law, uh, uh, regional protection of human rights, and then the internal legal system and how that correlates with the international lex specialis. So uh, we have three distinguished speakers who I will um, present uh, as they come to bring their um, to bring their presentations. Uh, we will start out with uh, Dr. Cristina Contartese, who is a lecturer in EU law at the Hague University of Applied Scientists, uh, Sciences. Previously, she was a postdoc uh, researcher at the Max Planck Institute in Luxembourg, as well as the I Court Center in Copenhagen. So Christina will be uh, delivering a presentation on EU international responsibility in international economic law from WTO to the Energy Charter Treaty. Christina, I will hand the floor directly over to you. And I would like to ask all of the um, participants in this panel to please keep your time because I think the discussion will be as interesting as the presentation themselves. So go on, Christina. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So good evening to all and uh, Kalispera to our Greek uh, colleagues. <laughs> so Kalispera. Um, uh, the focus of my presentation, as the title suggests, is the EU international responsibility in the field of international economic law. And more specifically, the purpose of my presentation is to address the practice, the recent practice, related to the normative control doctrine in some case studies, as well as the practice related to the so-called rule of proceduralization within the field of international economic law, as already mentioned. Uh, as uh, some colleagues, some previous speakers already recalled, uh, the normative control doctrine implies that the Union is deemed responsible for the actions of its member states in the course of uh, implementing EU law. Therefore, in order to assess, investigate the normative control doctrine, the key word is implementation, implementation of EU law by, by the EU member states. And what I argue in this respect is that the normative control is 
an emerging practice, although the practice is scant, as already it was stressed in the first panel. Um, so some emerging practice can be identified, and this emerging practice seems to me quite clear. Uh, in leading to the conclusion that the normative control doctrine has been, has been applied in some cases. However, in my view, what remains unclear is the identification of the exact criteria requirements for the normative control doctrine to be applied. What I also argue is that where there are some inconsistencies in the application of the normative control doctrine, this does not mean, in my understanding, that the normative control doctrine has to be put in question as such. So essentially that there is something wrong with the, the normative control doctrine as such, rather these inconsistencies in my view should lead to further investigate the criteria, the requirements for the normative control to be applied. I also argue that another practice has already emerged, the so-called rule of proceduralization that also Professor uh, Passivirta mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, my purpose is also to, to investigate, uh, to, to, to ask whether this may be considered as an appropriate solution in light of the inconsistencies when the EU international responsibility is at stake. The rule of proceduralization implies that it is up to the EU to identify the proper respondent uh, before an international tribunal, essentially uh, in uh, so far in an investor state uh, dispute under investment uh, agreements concluded by the EU. Uh, as a consequence, in this, uh, uh, under uh, this scenario, under the rule of proceduralization, neither the claimant to the dispute, nor the arbitral tribunal will have will have the chance, will be able to express their view on this matter. So on how uh, to identify the proper respondent, whether the EU, the member states or both together. So essentially my presentation will be divided uh, into two parts. The first part of my presentation will refer to the case law on EU international responsibility um, before the WTO dispute settlement bodies and the Energy Charter Treaty, whereas the second part will refer to the recent EU investment agreements and the so-called rule of proceduralization. So, as already mentioned, the first case study is a WTO that is the allocation of international responsibility of the EU and its member states before the WTO dispute settlement bodies. As other speakers before me already recalled and explained very well, the WTO dispute settlement bodies in general seem to have accepted the idea of European exceptionalism, so essentially the attribution of international responsibility mainly to the EU and they essentially, the panels essentially allowed the European Commission to speak on behalf of both the EU and the member states. However, and this is the main issue for my presentation, the Airbus case, which is a very well-known case, uh, where the member states were not exonerated from responsibility is an, is, as, is an important exception in relation to the application of the normative control doctrine. And essentially the Airbus case uh, reopens the debate on what normative control essentially entails. Uh, so allow me to uh, recall uh, um, briefly that in the uh, Airbus uh, case, uh, the Commission claimed that the European Union was the only proper respondent, so the EU alone without the member states, whereas the panel concluded that both the EU and the member states were responsible and 
uh, the panel observed, and I quote the panel, the fact that some member states of the WTO are also member states of the European community does not affect their individual status as members of the WTO. And also allow me to briefly recall that in the Airbus case, it is important to stress that the United States brought the claims against the EU and four of its member states. But what matters from an EU perspective is that although the subject matter from an EU perspective falls under the EU exclusive competence, there had been no EU decision authorizing those member states subsidies, which was the issue at stake. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, these member state subsidies fell under the areas of state aid where the Commission's control is uh, exempted. And so this is the main uh, key issue to understand the Airbus case. And I will now quote uh, a very well-known uh, author on uh, EU international responsibility, which is uh, Offmeister, uh, that in uh, who in a well-known uh, article published in 2010, European Journal of International Law, essentially uh, stated that the notion of normative control should be linked to specific criteria, such as, and the quote of the author, when it is established that the union law governs both the substantive legality of and the available remedies for a measure, then the union exercises normative control over it. And essentially, this is the definition of normative control that I borrow from this author. Uh, and he further adds that in such situation, it would also only be the union, so only the union, which could modify or allow the modification of such measure in order to bring into line with uh, an international norm. So th this is uh, once again, the, the, also the relevant question. So who is the actor, the EU or the member states who can modify the measure at stake, so the measure considered in breach of an international obligation. Uh, so in my understanding, uh, the relevant question is to ask whether uh, the criteria for the application of the normative control are made, obviously to be assessed on a case-by-case -case analysis, rather than questioning the doctrine as such. So essentially, recalling the first panel, my presentation seems to attempt to answer the question that uh, Vladislav and Antonius raised in the first panel, that is the degree of normative control and what is the degree of normative control. And this is exactly the, the element, so the element of the degree of normative control, that in my understanding is the key issue uh, and also the element that distinguishes the normative control doctrine from the so-called competence-based approach. Uh, in this latter, for the competence-based approach, the focus of the analysis mainly relies on the nature of the competencies rather than uh, their proper exercise. And this is a further reason, in my view, to consider the declaration of competencies that uh, Professor Passivirta mentioned earlier as not able, so therefore unable, to reach the purpose for which they have been uh, uh, created. And this view uh, about, uh, let's say, the, the limits of declarations of uh, competencies is what uh, essentially emerges also from uh, the, it, it is the general perception of the legal uh, scholars. Mm? So they emphasize the limits of this mechanism, declarations of competence, uh, rather than their potential uh, advantages. Another case that I would like to, uh, um, to, to address 
uh, is the Electra Bell case. Uh, also, this is a very well known uh, uh, case, and it, it is Electra Bell versus Hungary. So, it is a further case study where the, an arbitral tribunal under the Energy Charter Treaty questioned whether the Union, rather than the EU member state, in this case it was Hungary, might have been the proper respondent and accordingly their responsible party. In Electra Bell, the arbitral tribunal clarified that, I'm going to quote it, where Hungary is required to act in compliance with a legally binding decision of an EU institution, uh, it cannot by itself entail international responsibility for Hungary under international law, and I'm still quoting uh, uh, the Electra Bell case, so the tribunal, Hungary can be responsible only for its own wrongful act. So essentially, in my understanding, these are uh, cases uh, that are indicative of this emerging uh, practice, uh, the application of the normative control, although scant, scant practice, as we already uh, stressed. In the second part of my presentation, I will refer to the recent practice under EU investment agreements and the so-called rule of proceduralization. This provision essentially entitles the EU to identify who is the proper respondent by requiring that investor delivers a notice, so the investor, the claimant, uh, delivers a notice requesting uh, such a clarification to the union, to the EU. Accordingly, the identification of the respondent remains under this procedure, the rule of proceduralization, remains in essence an internal EU matter. Now, we should approach uh, this procedure, I believe, from both an EU perspective and an international perspective. Why? Because if we just consider the EU perspective, in my understanding, the procedure does not raise concerns at all. And this was proved also by the legal reasoning of the Court of Justice in Opinion 117. Opinion 117 concerns the compatibility of the investment chapter under the EU-Canada Free Trade Agreement with the EU treaties. Moreover, uh, the EU um, identify the proper respondent, how? By relying on the regulation on financial responsibility, that is an EU Act adopted in 2014. So as already mentioned, a truly internal um, procedure. And uh, recently, in 2019, the reference to the rule of proceduralization was also expressly added in the EU statement to the Energy Charter Treaty. And I believe that this further practice proves the willingness of the EU to support such rule, the rule of proceduralization in EU international agreements. However, as I said earlier, we should also analyze and assess uh, this rule, the rule of proceduralization also from an international perspective. Because it is true that this procedure prevents both uh, the claimant, the investor, and the tribunal to play a role in this respect. So one may legitimately wonder why, for instance, such a rule should also be added in other draft agreements. And I have in mind, for instance, the future draft, ag draft agreement for due accession to the European Convention on Human Rights. And personally, I believe that the answer to this question should be and should remain a negative one since the role of the Strasbourg court should be preserved as well as its case law on the attribution of international responsibility. So in essence, in my view, 
what I argue is that the rule of procedurization should not be seen, so should not be seen as an easy solution to be applied in any, in any legal context. It has certainly important advantages in the investment field. However, it's not an easy fixed solution. To conclude, in the light of the current scant practice, and this is the main uh, issue today, the, the scant practice, as recalled in the first panel, only the future practice will determine the exact evolution of both approaches, that is the normative control on the one hand and the rule of proceduralization on the other hand. And the two approaches, however, uh, display different consequences. Uh, what I want to stress, what I try to stress is that the rule of proceduralization aims to internalize at the EU level, so it is essentially an internal instrument, a debate that in my understanding is and should remain international. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Christina, for this uh, presentation and the thoughts you added, both on the ambiguous application of the normative control doctrine within the WTO settlement bodies, and then uh, your questioning about this rule of proceduralization. So thank you. I'm sure um, there will be some more discussion on this, these issues uh, as we go along. So uh, the next uh, speaker on my list is... Uh, Professor uh, Vasilis Pergandis, uh, you all have know him, of course, and he's the organizer of today's conference. Uh, Vasilis is the Assistant Professor of Public International Law at the Faculty of Law at uh, of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, and he's also the academic coordinator of the Eurus, uh, a project which um, um, is uh, this conference is is, is a part of. Or, um, so, and which is run by the Calliope Kufa Foundation. Now, Vasilis will be talking about, uh, yes, the EU uh, international responsibility uh, in the field of human rights uh, protection, and of course, developments regarding uh, the, the uh, discussions on the EU accession to the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, I'll give him the floor directly, and let me note that we already have uh, some interesting questions, especially by, um, my colleague and friend, um, uh, Dr. Polakievich from, um, from before, but he's, um, he's posing an interesting question. So over to you, Vasilis, and of course, you know your rules, you keep the time as you requested us. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Professor Pazardzis. Now I'm, let me share my presentation. I think you can see it on full screen now. So I will be speaking about issues of uh, EU international responsibility in the field of human rights, especially concerning the EU accession to the European Convention of Human Rights. I will first present the um, relevant clauses on attribution and correspondence in the draft accession agreement of 2013, which was rejected by the Court of Justice of the European Union. Then I will um, make a presentation of the current negotiations and how they are heading in order to remedy and uh, modify some of those issues that were raised by uh, the uh, Luxembourg court. And finally, I will speak about what are the problems with the uh, direction the negotiations are heading. Now, very briefly, just to remind that the terms of the EU accession to the European Convention of Human Rights have been repeatedly uh, stated in various documents and nowadays in the first documents of the current negotiation. Any adjustment to the European Convention in order to take into account the particularities of the EU should be kept to what is strictly necessary. There should be a constant respect to equality of the parties, the so-called principle of equal footing. Uh, there is a great um, um, uh, worry that applications 
should be addressed to the correct respondent because now it will be both the EU and the member states being parties to the convention. And of course, um, these negotiations, this new um, uh, the, the agreement uh, allowing the uh, Union to accede should preserve and respect the specific characteristics of the Union and not affect EU competences or uh, EU institutions' powers. And here the main issue is the autonomy of the Union legal order. I won't speak so much about that, but from time to time I will explain why these rules uh, that have been drafted are so weird because in many aspects they try to protect the autonomy of the Union legal order. Now the responsibility question in the draft accession agreement concerns two aspects. First, to whom an international wrongful act will be attributed, but also who will be the respondent party in the procedures before the Strasbourg Court. And of course, the two main, uh, the two particular traits of the EU that have been already discussed beforehand by various uh, speakers are the shifting competences, that the EU competence are ballooning from um, um, as the time passes, and also this phenomenon of executive federalism, which means the Union legislates, the member states implement, and that creates um, a, a lot of problems concerning human rights pro uh, protection. Now, in the draft accession agreements, there are two main um, rules concerning, um, um, let's say, responsibility. Um, I try to use terms that are neutral because no one really understands what are these clauses. So in one, uh, Article 1.3, I will say that these two articles, Article 1.3 and 1.4, they don't have the same formulation, but in the explanatory report, it becomes clear that they, have, they follow the same logic. And the logic is the EU will be responsible for acts of EU organs and organs acting on its um, or their behalf. And um, in Article 1, Paragraph 4, there is the opposite rule, the mirror rule, let's say, that EU member states will be responsible for acts of their organs, even if uh, um, uh, these um, uh, acts uh, implement um, EU um, law. Um, uh, so the idea here is for the European Court of Human Rights to do a purely and strictly factual assessment, um, simply determine who is the person that act physically, as has been said by previous uh, speakers, and attribute the contact to that specific person without dwelling into the competence uh, question. And of course, that is a problem because, as we said, the Union exercises normative control over member state actions when they implement EU law. The famous Bosphorus-like scenario of EU member states implementing strict obligations or even in cases of member state discretion, um, uh, um, the, the breach of the European Convention on Human Rights might even there uh, stem from EU law, which should be the sole competent to remedy it. So it has been argued that only very few cases will come before the court, the Strasbourg court, and will be attributable to the EU because the physical action, who has done the conduct uh, that results to the violation of the European Convention, the answer to that is almost always the member state because member states implement. And it has been argued that the last sentence of Article 1.4, uh, which says, um, 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 uh, which I can find, um, speaks about, let me find, yes, um, uh, that this rule of Article 1.4 about attribution to the member states shall not preclude the European Union from being responsible as a co-respondent for a violation resulting from such an act measure or omission in accordance with Article 36, Paragraph 4 of the Convention and Article 3 of this agreement. Some have argued, and we had that disagreement also with uh, um, a colleague, um, Stian Obi Johansen, that we wrote 
an article uh, together that it is about to appear. Uh, um, uh, some argue that uh, in reality, the rules of Article 3 allow also for that scenario of derivative responsibility when the union normative control or tries to circumvent or facilitates and aids a member state and that member state afterwards um, violates uh, um, the convention. I, I, the argument is that this uh, Article 3 can also help. Now, uh, my view is that Article 3, and especially Article 3, Paragraph 7, which speaks about this joint responsibility of the EU and Member States when the correspondent mechanism has been activated, it cannot be considered as an attribution rule. And it cannot be considered as an attribution rule that allows to attribute the responsibility this time to the European Union while attributing the acts to the member state, because um, in reality, this is a facultative rule. Either it is the EU that requests to become a correspondent, the EU of the member state, uh, depending on who is the initial respondent, or it is um, the, uh, um, the EU um, uh, or the member state act accepts an invitation by the European Court of Human Rights. So in all cases, this is not really a legal rule. It is simply a procedural mechanism. We cannot speak of attribution when this is self-judged by the European Union or member states. Um, now, you see here the rules of Article 3 concerning how correspondence works. And uh, let me now go to my next uh, slide, because there have been, uh, by the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, it took issue with uh, especially Article 3 concerning the correspondent mechanism. It didn't say um, something, really something about Article 1. And it said that uh, um, in determining the correspondence of the European Court of Human Rights, when there has been a request by the EU, or when it decides in Article 3, Paragraph 7, to depart from joint responsibility upon the views of uh, the um, um, parties to the dispute, these two assessments by the European Court are incompatible with the principle of autonomy. So what is the way forward after this construction? The way forward seems to be, and uh, according to the negotiations, it goes in that uh, way, um, an effort to delete uh, the discretion that was recognized to the Strasbourg Court in Article 3 uh, concerning who is going to be co-respondent and in Article 3.7 concerning the non-recognition of joint responsibility. The court had the possibility to say, no, I'm not going to apply the rule of joint responsibility and internalize all those elements within the internal EU rules. And you see here already the uh, chair uh, paper that was uh, um, drafted in August 2020 in order to systematize the issues that the new negotiations will have to tackle. And you see here how it says that perhaps allowing the European Court to apportion responsibility doesn't help and doesn't add value to the accession of the European Union. And perhaps one form of joint responsibility will be perfect. And um, also another um, uh, proposal uh, that uh, perhaps in various articles we should rely on the EU's own understanding and interpre interpretation of EU law, since those rules concern the competence allocation, let's say, or who is controlling whom in the uh, system of the European Union. That could also be a problem if it is left according to the uh, Luxembourg Court. Um, that could also be a problem if it was left to the European Court of Human Rights. So 
This chair paper is the first proposal to subject the procedure of correspondence to the wishes of the European Union. It has never been mentioned before uh, so uh, formally, and we have now such a, a, a proposal, which has been unfortunately, uh, according to my view, materialized very recently in the new proposals that were presented in the eighth, I think, meeting in January 2021. In that meeting, the plausibility assessment where the Strasbourg court was considering if it is plausible to have a correspondent have been dropped, so that power of the Strasbourg court is abandoned. And also there is a new rule on termination of correspondency. And, um, and, and you see there in which meeting, the sixth and the seventh, in which paragraph of the minutes of that meeting it was first proposed. So the new proposal, or, uh, proposes a new Article 5, where it is actually not a plausibility test by the Strasbourg Court, but it is on account of an assessment by the European Union of the applicable European Union law that the correspondence will be determined. Now, of course, there must be a so-called sugar coating in that rule that completely uh, empties the European Court of Human Rights of its powers. So we see here some weird things such as that the European Union will submit a result declaration to the court and, um, and, the, and all the parties to the proceedings which will indicate if the conditions for correspondence are fulfilled and before the uh, high contracting party becomes a correspondent, the court shall ensure that the views of all parties to the proceedings have been shared. Now, this seems weird because in the expl expl explanation to that new proposal, to the, uh, not that new three paragraph five article, the um, explanation says that the interpretation of EU law would be considered final and authoritative for the purpose of this provision. So what the European Union will say will be final and authoritative. Now, how the European Court will remain a master of its own proceedings is not really explained in that report. Um, it says that it will remain a master of its own proceedings because it will take a formal decision for joining a correspondent to the proceedings. But in reality, if we leave outside issues like whether an admissibility um, question is involved, the main issue, whether you have a scenario of correspondence, is not really decided by the European Court of Human Rights. Um, the good thing is that the views of the parties will be heard before the EU reason declaration. At least the EU reason declaration will need to address the views of the parties to the proceedings. More problematic is the new Article 5a, which this, uh, um, introduces the possibility to terminate correspondence. And that too is based on an EU reasoned opinion. So it is the EU that on the basis of evolution of the context will be deciding through a reasoned opinion that the conditions of paragraphs two and three for correspondence are not anymore valid and applicable and thus correspondence should be terminated. I argue that this rule is extremely problematic because it undermines the proper administration of justice and um, uh, really the court becomes a spectator to what the EU decides about correspondence. And there is there also a problem that we don't see nowhere the, where the views of the parties will be um, shared. Afterwards, we will see that there has been some discussion and proposals to at least remedy that. Finally, the new proposal concerning paragraph 7 completely deletes the power of the court to decide not to adjudicate on a joint responsibility paradigm. And someone can say that this is logical because now you have the new uh, paragraph 5a that allows the EU to terminate correspondence and thus joint responsibility. So that power is also shifted to the European Union from the court of Strasbourg. Now, what have been the reactions to these new proposals in January 2021? And, and you see here that the EU was not satisfied with the rule of Article 3.5. And it said that it is not so clear that the reasoned declaration by the EU 
will be in a way binding for everyone and that it should be explicitly and precisely mentioned that it is the EU that ultimately will assess if the material conditions are met. In contrast to that, you have other delegations, we can assume that they are not EU member states, that express concern that the wording was not efficiently clear with regard to the court having the last word and being a master of the proceedings. And you also have a lot of criticism concerning article, a paragraph 5a, uh, where about the hearing of the views of the parties, about the fact that it is the EU that has the decision to terminate correspondence. And several delegations stated that the role of the European Court of Human Rights in taking the decision to terminate the correspondent mechanism should be further clarified. And once again, they insisted that it is the court that should have the last word. Now, how can that be a compromise with the commentary that says the final and authoritative um, decision will be in the European Union? It is up to the negotiators to find the solution. Now, I will be very brief because I assume I don't really have a lot of time. I will uh, only uh, use two minutes just to conclude. Now, all those issues that have been taken from the powers of uh, the Strasbourg Court are now uh, will now be assessed by the European Union, we assume, through EU internal rules. And of course, that is a serious problem, both for the question of the Lex Specialis and for the question of proper administration of justice. I will speak only about the latter because Lex Specialis, I'm sure it will be covered by um, um, Lorenzo Gasbari. Now, concerning proper administration of justice, the effort of these new proposals to override the interpretative and judicial authority of the Strasbourg Court by depriving it the power to interpret union law, whether we have um, uh, control, whether we have strict obligations, whether there is discretion of member states, and also its power to allocate responsibility and determine the proper remedies for the execution of the judgments is extremely problematic. The end internalization uh, of those rules at the EU level works at the expense of the applicant. Uh, the applicant will be less informed about how to seek redress and who finally will be on the other side as a respondent, at least until the EU uh, decides so. And it cannot object, obviously, it cannot consent, it cannot object. The EU can change, actually, the respondent in the case if it decides to do so. And uh, that could be also a problem for member states if the EU at one moment decides that I don't want to be corresponded anymore and leave the member states out in the cold to pay the price for something where the EU perhaps also had some uh, obligations. And also the termination of the procedures by the EU and the Court of Justice will translate into a serious disadvantage for the applicant and the respondent termination for the correspondent of uh, the procedure. So I don't know what are the solutions, whether there should be an automatic compensation and then afterwards the EU apportion responsibility uh, inter se, internally, um, and or whether we could uh, uh, seek the permission of the applicant before there is this internal apportionment and the EU decides uh, who will be the respondent and the correspondent. And um, my conclusion is that in the end, those proposals indeed substantiate a privileged position for the European Union. And it will be extremely difficult for the non-EU member states to accept them. We see already in the very diplomatic language used that some states are, have serious doubts and um, objections to these new uh, proposals. And um, uh, uh, in the end, I think that this effort to equate the European Court of Human Rights being able to uh, fulfill its role and on the other side to not at all touch upon the uh, competence allocation and the interpretation of EU law concerning whether we have strict obligations or discretion of member states, etc., is almost impossible 
uh, to, for, to, to realize that equation. And I very much doubt whether these negotiations will uh, manage to arrive to a, a satisfactory uh, result. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vasilis. Yes, that is a big question that needs to be discussed. Um, as we are um, uh, uh, lacking in time, I think we should proceed directly to the next um, um, speaker. Um, and then, of course, Jörg uh, Polakievich uh, will have the floor afterwards. I think we need to go right ahead um, uh, and finish this uh, the, with the final panelists. And then we will turn to questions and I will give the floor to those who have requested it. So uh, the final um, uh, presenter for this panel is uh, Lorenzo Gaspari, a research fellow at the Department of Law in Bocconi. Um, he's a junior editor of the Oxford Database on International Organizations. And Lorenzo also is a co-convener of the interest group on the Law of International Organizations of the European Society of International Law. Uh, Lorenzo will be speaking on EU responsibility and the quality of its law, reconciling the internal legal system with the international lex specialis, if that can be done. So Lorenzo, over to you. Please also try to keep your time so then we can move to questions and have some time for the discussion. Perfect. Thank you so much, Professor Bazak. And thank you all for uh, having me. It's indeed a real pleasure to be with you and share my research on the law of international organization. So exactly what I'm going to do in my presentation is to seek to reconcile the opposing perspectives on the complexing uh, relationship between uh, institutional EU law and international law. So my speech is divided in uh, uh, five main arguments. My starting point is that the international responsibility of the European Union is affected by the absence of a clear conceptualization of what international organizations are. So I'm going to contend that our field of study is affected by an either or mindset. Exactly as before uh, Cristina Contarese was mentioning, it's important to um, uh, highlight the different perspectives, the existence of external international point of view and the internal institutional point of view. Then my second point is that the Lex Specialist Principle is a key notion to distinguish between the different approaches and different uh, uh, points of view. Then, uh, third point is a rejection of the criterion called normative control as a form of lex speciali, because I think it's, uh, you will see how it is a particular way to conceptualize the European Union. And finally, in my fourth and fifth points, I will rebut the header or mindset and describe the dual legal nature of the European Union law, discussing how special rules of international responsibility may apply to the uh, EU. Okay. So, uh, the uh, first part, uh, I'm going in order. My first argument is that the responsibility of the European Union is affected by the absence of a clear conceptualization of what international organizations are. And uh, I think this is something that uh, applies to all international organizations. We, lack, we, don't, we cannot understand the European Union as much as we, don't, we lack a concept to understand the United Nations, for instance. So this is a, the fundamental institutional dilemma uh, uh, and under this dilemma, the European Union is an international organization exactly as the other. So the concept uh, of supranational organization or uh, regional integrational organization is not uh, able to solve this dilemma. Uh, this that simply characterize the status of international organizations in international law. And this is what I was referring before when, when Antonio Stanzanopoulos was mentioning uh, the reason why the International Law Commission did those mistakes, because I think that it didn't approach the theoretical issues behind the notions of international organization. And this fundamental dilemma concerns how to define the relationship between the organization and its member states, and in particular whether international organizations are able to develop legal systems that are separate from international law, and consequently, uh, how member states can be at the same time internal subjects of this legal system and sovereign subjects of international uh, law. Uh, as Nico was said before, the, what matters is the nature of the rules, the nature of the internal rules of the organizations. And I, I would like to start with the famous word of the European Court of Justice and highlighting and 
uh, improving those words, which when it says famously that the community constitutes a new legal order of international law. Okay, but this is perfectly described the problems, because then what is a new legal order of international law? How the derivation from international law is compatible with the creation of a new legal order? And here again, it's important the perspective. Are you lawyers focusing on new legal order, international lawyers focusing on off international law? So how to reconcile these two parts? And uh, this is not a specificity of the European Union, as mentioned, because also the International Court of Justice actually said something very similar for the, the United Nations. Maybe it's less known and it absolutely and definitely it has less political impact, but in 1954, in the advisory opinion on the effect of awards of the uh, administrative tribunal, he claimed that the United Nations constitutes a legal order, uh, at least for what concerns its internal administrative uh, machinery. And what I'm claiming is that in a nutshell is that we don't know what international organizations are, because there is not a legal conceptualization able to define the peculiar legal system created by the organization. So this is my uh, premise. And moving to my second point on the relevance of the Lex Specialis principle, I think that it, this is fundamental to decide and define how to distinguish between the different uh, conceptualizations. Because the, fa the fact is that in the context of international organizations, Lex Specialis may not be triggered, as we already discussed, not only by the regime under which the organizations act, for example, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, containing specific rules on the European Union. But it's also the rules that constitute the organizations themselves that may derogate from international law. And so uh, we have to focus on how the international ex specialist applies in the relationship between the members and the organization to identify different conceptualizations. So here in this slide, in this chaotic slide, uh, tri triangles are represented as states, and the circles are the in different conceptualizations of organizations. In the first one, uh, Lex Specialis is applicable in the relationship between the organization and its member state. And here the rules of the organizations are uh, international law. And, and this is the thin uh, veil of the organizations as I depicted uh, in this uh, slide. Then, uh, moving to the second perspective, the second conception of what is an international organization, here the Lex Specialis is sort of rejected by the uh, legal system that is created. And uh, under these conceptualizations, the rules of the organizations are internal law, basically internal law, purely internal law as will be similar to domestic uh, law in this sense. Then a third perspective uh, will be that um, organizations are different from one another, so one conceptualization is not even possible to think of. And, and so uh, for some organizations, like specialists will apply uh, in the relationship between the member states organizations always. For other organizations, no. Uh, typically, we say that the UN will be based on the uh, international law, while the European Union, uh, even other organizations, such as the uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation, Cooperation in Europe, will not be, will develop something that is not uh, international uh, law. And then finally, a fourth perspective will be that uh, the uh, Lex Specialis principle applies only for certain rules. So, for example, concerning external relations and uh, will not apply for internal and purely administrative things. For example, for uh, the uh, civil service regulations, which is probably what the International Court of Justice wanted to say when claiming that the UN constitutes a legal order, but not uh, security Council resolutions are international law, but if you look at uh, uh, staff rules, then it's internal law. Uh, so I, I, now, of course, I don't have time to contest uh, each of the different conceptualizations, which is the basis of what I'm doing in the book and, uh, and uh, what I did before for the doctorate, for the PhD. But what I would like to highlight like, is that these different perspectives are only perspectives exactly. I mean, they only take a partial view of what is an international organization. And uh, that does, doesn't understand all the, the, the concept of and the phenomenon of international organizations in all its uh, uh, complexities. So my th uh, third point, and speaking in the context particular of the uh, European uh, Union for EU responsibility, 
is that the criterion of normative control is based on the idea, as we said already, that the, in certain circumstances, member states act as organ of the organization. And so the international personality basically is left behind the uh, institutional veil of the organization. So what I, what I would like to say is that this is not a form of lex specialis, because it's a matter on how the, uh, it's the idea that the European Union developed an internal legal order and EU law is internal law and not international law. So, and this is the internal law that regulates the uh, relationship between the members and the organization. So, as I say, I just wanted to speak in this picture, it's normative control is internal and it connects the organizations with the uh, member states. Okay. So, um, for instance, the, the, the World Trade Organization Supplement Body, as I was mentioned before, I think that it does not apply a model of attribution of conduct in this case. But it's, it's, what it's doing is applying a concept of an international organization in which EU law is purely inter internal law. But then, conversely, the, the European Court of Human Rights tends to privilege a concept of the European Union under which its rules are international law and sort of the personality of the member states, uh, the resource base from the uh, institutional way. And uh, then there's something to say that if the European Union then is able to convince a third state here in the picture represented outside this the blue circle, and to convince them under the terms of a treaty that its member state, the member state of the EU, is not responsible for the acts of its organ, but only the EU is responsible, then of course it's okay in the sense that it agrees that it's consent, as we mentioned before uh, in the first panel, and then that's it, it's fine. But again, this is not a criterion of attribution of conduct. It's just a, the content of a primary rule, a primary obligation that was accepted by the parties of that treaties. And this is not how the international uh, thinking about normative control in, in the relationship with a third uh, entity, with a third uh, states, is not how the international commission even thought about the concept of lex specialis. And uh, it's, lex specialis applies in those situations mentioned in the previous panel. So not concerning uh, the uh, concerning the relationship internal to the uh, order, the relationship between the organizations and the member states. So, um, so as, as I said at the beginning, the absence of a theory on how to conceptualize international organizations is not a problem that concerns only the European Union. And exactly the International Commission didn't take a clear positions on whether the Lex Specialis is applicable in the relationship between the organization and its member states and completely left the question uh, uh, open. Again, this is the source of all the uh, problems and how to move after this uh, fundamental uh, dilemma. And my fourth point is that I think we can solve this dilemma by adopting a comprehensive perspective that acknowledge the existence of the internal and the international points of view. And I call this idea the dual legal natures of international organizations, uh, and which is based on the fact that the constitutive instrument is at the same time a treaty and the constitution of a new uh, community. And this is what the International Court of Justice said. And I think also this is what the European Court of Justice said, speaking about a legal order of international law. So creation of a new development system derived from international law. And, uh, if the, and this is sort of established in, in, in scholarship of the dual natures of constitutive instrument itself. But if the constitutive instrument then is at the same time a treaty and a constitution, well, I would claim that also the secondary law possesses the same dual nature. And uh, here it's relevant to speak about member states, we go back to that, because they are never organs or perfectly purely organs of the organizations, but they are never third parties of, of, in relationship with the organizations. But they are both at the same time. So uh, uh, exactly at this point that we can appreciate the, how to reconcile and to balance international law specialists with the uh, European Union institutional law. Uh, by claiming that internal EU law possesses uh, this dual uh, nature. And uh, so it basically it's the same, at the same time it is lex specialist in relations with international law and also part of a separate legal order. So usually when I say this and uh, I'm looking forward to, to, to the reactions, I see hybrids rising everywhere because how it's, it's totally incoherent 
that law can be part of two legal system at the same time. But I think that this is the conditions caused by the legal pluralism in which we live. And um, it's the chameleontic natures of uh, law, uh, using the, the metaphor of Aventura de Sousa Santos, which speaks of the interlegality and the concept of interlegality. And as a matter, uh, it's an effect of legal uh, pluralism. So, and uh, after this uh, bit of theoretical, uh, uh, what I'm going to conclude is to, uh, is to go a little bit in, in practical detail, what does it change and how to uh, uh, um, attribute the conducts to the, the European Union, to the international organizations. And I think here my consequences, my, the, the, the conclusions are very similar to what Professor Zahanopoulos uh, was saying uh, before. And um, because I think that, and here I agree with the EU commissions, with the comments with the EU commission, that EU law, uh, if, you, if we think that it's internal in nature, is relevant to attribute the conduct of the member states to the organization when the member is acting as an organ of the organization. And in this sense, Article 6, ARIO, exactly apply as Article 4, ARIO applies as concerning the internal nature of domestic uh, law. And, uh, but then, at the, at the same time, adopting the, uh, compatibly with the, putting in balance with the international uh, natures of the EU law, this does not exclude that the contribution of conduct to the member states uh, the, uh, themselves. So member states do not, they're not hiding in the uh, institutional veil of the organization. Uh, and so the, the criterion of normative control claimed by the Commission is actually a false problem, I think, because uh, and who is the organ of the European Union is actually determined by institutional rules, as you can read in Article 2, Hario, here in the uh, slide. And, um, and the, the fundamental element is the parallel attribution and the dual attribution when a single conduct is applied. And um, here is why uh, answering to Nico when he said, why did they didn't use Article 15, Article 17? Because this is the issue is different because here we are speaking about a single course of conduct and which is attributed to a multiplicity of states, not to conduct and in connections with one another, which is the content of Article 15, 17 uh, of the projects of the International Homestead Commission. As then to conclude, uh, what Professor Sarnopoulos was saying before, this is very, very simple and very more effective framework. I totally agree. And, um, it, and it also helps to uh, highlight, it highlights the, the dual natures of international organizations and the fact that member states can be at the same time an organ and a third party. And uh, also, um, exactly some, my last words is just to say that I would like to highlight that this does not automatically mean that both parties are responsible. Because again, as is already mentioned, we're only speaking here uh, on concerning attribution of conduct. It's another question whether they have an obligation. Obligations can be shared by both, can only the EU, only the member states. It's also a question on uh, which kind of treaties we're speaking about. We're speaking about customary international law. Uh, so we, the, the most essential point is to keep a distinction in the clear, keep always keep uh, clear distinctions between uh, the question of attribution of conduct and who is bearing the primary uh, obligation. So I think my time is more or less uh, over and uh, thank you so much for your attention. Of course, I'm here for the questions and even after. Thank you so much. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Lorenzo, for this uh, perspective. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I think we need a few minutes to, um, for uh, questions and answers. Um, so I know that um, uh, Georgi Polakievich had uh, raised a question before and he had raised his hand. I'm not sure he's still with us and if he would want to uh, intervene now, so I don't... Um, okay, Georgi is there. Good to see you, Georgi, you have the floor, finally. And then we also have another question on the Q&A um, function. So, Jörg. Hello to everybody. Thank you, uh, Faye, for uh, giving me the floor. 
I must admit, I um, came sort of almost by accident into this very passion, very interesting and uh, thoughtful seminar. I'm not prepared. I'm also in my rather casual dress, um, but still at the office, as you can see, because normally I just wanted to reply to a few emails. But then <laughs> I came into this um, fascinating discussion. I don't want to be very long. Uh, I um, maybe because even the program I discovered more or less going along uh, and I had not seen when I raised my first question that there was in fact a panel dealing precisely with the EU accession. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I will just, uh, it will be too long now to make long comments, uh, but to the, but uh, congratulations to all the uh, three panelists. Uh, Maybe just as an explanation to uh, it is Professor Perganti, sir, who spoke about this very difficult issue of um, the correspondent uh, mechanism. <laughs> and uh, just to explain maybe the general, um, the general positions, so, uh, to give you also flavor about the negotiations. I mean, it's not a secret. You can find the reports of these meetings uh, on the website of the um, uh, Council of Europe. Basically, there are two positions, uh, and I think they both can claim a certain legitimacy. They explain the approach that uh, was uh, discussed by Professor Bergantis, by Vasilis, but also criticized a bit. But you have the one position, which is clearly the position taken by the Commission as the negotiator for the EU. They say we have the opinion of the Court of Justice. We have these 10 or 12 objections. We have to take one by one and we have to give to each of them a clear reply in the form of preferably an amendment to the accession agreement. And on the other hand, you have the position which is taken by of course, the, some of the non-EU member states, more or less vocal. And uh, they say, but if we do that, uh, if we precisely follow the Court of Justice a la lettre, then, in fact, the jurisdiction of the Strasbourg Court in EU law matters will be more restricted after accession than it is now. Because, as you know very well, via the responsibility of member states, many EU law cases are before the court of Strasbourg even without accession. What is only excluded is precisely the Frontex scenario or maybe the European public prosecutor when you have a supranational EU institution directly interfering with rights. Uh, this is excluded now without accession. Um, so you have these two positions which are a bit irreconcilable uh, and I think, well, so far the negotiations have nevertheless made some progress. It's slow because we are also still having only video conferences, but uh, I would still think there has been some progress and you find, as I, you will, as I said, uh, the, the, the meeting reports are public, uh, so you find also proposals of clauses that have been proposed. I mean, as I said, now it's still a very early time. Um, but my question, in fact, now to, not to monopolize the floor, uh, is the question, I was in fact intrigued uh, by the previous panel, uh, this uh, discussion about the interplay of Dario and, uh, and um, EU law. And uh, because there we have a very concrete question, uh, which you can find in the meeting report of the last uh, meeting of this negotiation group where the EU has made uh, this proposal that I put in the chat, uh, because maybe in two, just very briefly, uh, the Court of Justice objected uh, to the Court of Human Rights having jurisdiction in areas where the Court of Justice has no jurisdiction and CFSP matters. And this, in fact, is probably the most difficult objection in a sense, because to really address it, you would have to change the EU treaties. Uh, which is not a very realistic option at this point. So the, what has the commission done? They proposed uh, what I put in the chat to have a attribution clause, which would in these areas where there's no 
jurisdiction by the Court of Justice would basically attribute or reattribute action even by the EU organs, officials, agencies uh, to the member states, either one or more or all. Uh, and uh, interestingly, in the last, it was short, you can find this also in the meeting report, some delegations raised the point, would such a clause not be contradictory to international law, would not be incompatible with international law, because international law has certain attribution rules. rules. And then there was also a discussion, is this in fact, um, would this be a lex specialis? Would such a clause qualify as a lex specialis under the ILC rules? So very interesting questions uh, at this uh, intersection of international EU law, which is quite fascinating. And I don't know whether anybody either from the previous or the current panel wants to comment on that. Sorry for being a bit long, but thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Um, and for those in the audience who might not know, um, Mr. Polakiewicz is the director of the uh, uh, legal advice in public international law of the Council of Europe. So he's a legal advisor and thank you for coming in uh, with these interesting remarks. I have one more question on the Q&A, Vasilis, which I possibly can read out perhaps. And then we can open the floor to some reactions uh, to both um, what uh, Georgi Polakievich has um, remarked, and then also to the second one. Is that okay with you? So the question on, in the Q&A is by uh, Nikolos Yanopoulos, and he is very much uh, triggered, again, it's on, I think, on the same issues, by the EU's proposal regarding the uh, potential accession to the con uh, European Convention. Um, uh, he says, Nicola says that this, the same problems that primarily relate to the kind of myopic stance of the Court of Justice uh, on the principle of autonomy of EU law are obvious in the effort to ex exclude important EU law issues from the judicial scrutiny of the Strasbourg Court. So Nicolas is wondering uh, what is the panel's or everyone's view on the actual potential of such an access, uh, accession to be fruitful. Um, personally, I have my doubts. Um, and he wonders whether this is going to be an Islamic marriage. It seems that if the EU pronounces, I divorce you again, the fragile and unequal marriage will fall apart. Exclamation. That is, of course, um, I'm just um, reading out the question by Nicolas Yanopoulos. Now, with your uh, permission, well, no, I have, I'm, I chair, so it's my permission, right? So can I then uh, open the floor both to the speakers of this panel and potentially to others, perhaps from the previous panels, uh, who wish to take the floor and react uh, to some of these very interesting comments that have been made? Um, with your permission, then, Vasilis, if... Um, I don't know whether you want to start uh, because it uh, mostly had to do with your topic, but then of course, if uh, Professor Pasivirta wants to comment or anyone else, of course, Christine, uh, um, Lorenzo, and then anybody else, please raise your hand. So Vasilius, can I just turn it to you first? I see then uh, Dr. Vulgar is also wanting to, to react. Thank you very much. Let me say that here I am at the university to have good internet and there is a party going on outside. So I tried to go to another office. I lost all of Lorenzo's presentation, so I really apologize. At least I'm back because I, I didn't have an even connection before. So um, I will be very brief, a brief concerning the second question. Um, autonomy, the, the, the strict rules of autonomy and whether on the basis of those rules it, there can be a fruitful accession of the European Convention of the EU on the European Convention of Human Rights. I think one of the topics that are worth uh, studying is whether the um, um, opinion 117 and it's a little bit more um, generous, let's say, approach to autonomy, 
um, generous approach to uh, limiting autonomy, um, whether it can be a, a, an example to follow in the negotiations concerning the accession of the European Union to the European Convention of Human Rights. I have my doubts, and we have discussed a little bit that also some months ago when we were discussing the same topics in uh, Geneva. And I have my doubts because I think that in the case of uh, human rights, um, the applicant has a different role than in the case of investors. Uh, there are other issues that are um, very important. However, I must add that um, uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union has uh, said that um, the systems, the international dispute settlement mechanism that might be added to international agreements to which the European Union adheres, becomes a party, must respect the principle of fair trial, the, the essence at least of the right to fair trial. And if the same, and the court said that in the opinion 117, uh, if the same is also applied in the case of uh, the uh, current negotiations for the accession of the European Union to the European Convention of Human Rights, I think that it starts being a little bit foggy, this respect for the essence of the principle of fair trial. If the European Union has the right um, unilaterally, through a reasoned opinion indeed, but without being controlled, to terminate procedures, to refuse being a correspondent, to change who is going to be the respondent, etc. I don't really see the point that I think Jörg uh, um, Polakiewicz also said that some of the things that uh, the EU seems to be reacting um, against have already been happening in the European Court of Human Rights. The control of whether states, member states apply strict obligations or they have discretion. This has been happening all this period and now it seems as if the European Union will be very uncomfortable if the European Court of Human Rights continues controlling those issues. So to answer that question, I think that uh, in order for the um, uh, accession to be fruitful, um, I, I also have, like Professor Pazardzis, a lot of doubts whether uh, in the way the European Union is treating the whole topic, uh, we will have uh, that uh, a fruit to full result. I think in some aspects, we will have a broader jurisdiction of the court and in uh, almost all of respects, I would say that the European Union will not be a bad faith respondent or correspondent and it will play with the rules of the games. But can we really rely on that when we don't give to the Strasbourg court the power to check if sometimes there is this bad faith or perhaps misunderstanding from the side of the union of what exactly the applicant is arguing. Now, very briefly, concerning the other question on the attribution rule, I will simply add to that question for Lorenzo. Um, in my view, if the rule that the EU is proposing is to shift for those areas where there is no control by the Luxembourg court, all responsibility, whether these are acts of EU organs or whether these are acts of member states, to member states, it doesn't seem so different from the proceduralization that Christina was explaining before, where it is the European Union in the end that simply informs the applicant who is going to be on the other side um, in the courtroom. So, and one would say if it is even incorporated in the agreement, even better. So anyone will know from before, beforehand in that area what will be the end result. Only the member states. So I don't know. I, it's for Lorenzo and Christina perhaps to also comment on that. Okay, before I turn to Lorenzo and Christina uh, and to, to sort of conclude, I also have uh, Nicolas Vulgaris who had raised his hand. Perhaps it is a question. So I'll give uh, Nicola the floor and then turn back to Christina and uh, Lorenzo, if that's okay, and then we'll conclude. So, Nicolos? Thank you very much, Professor. Um, super quickly, uh, Vasilis. Um, I was just, I uh, want a clarification with respect to Article 5A, which I find completely unprecedented. At which stage during the proceedings will the EU be allowed to unilaterally 
um, determine that the, the, um, the corresponding mechanism is no longer in application. The proposal says that uh, if during the prior, prior for instance, if during the prior involvement procedure, the EU resolves an issue, so the responsibility of one or of the two of the respondents is resolved or is clarified that it is not raised, etc., then it can make that reasoned opinion. So I assume that this should be done before the court arrives to um, uh, at least the substance of the case. But from the um, uh, from the proposal, it is not completely clarified, if I can go there. Perhaps we can discuss the other question and can, I can return to that I'm one. Because the European Court of Human Rights does not distinguish, as the ICJ does, in uh, between, I mean, in preliminary objections and merits. So therefore, I mean, the application, I mean, practically could, could have some, uh, uh, could be very interesting. That's, thank you, that, that, that's all, that's all, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I would also, um, okay, I'll turn to Christina briefly and uh, Lorenzo, maybe they want to react. Uh, but I think the question uh, put my, by Mr. Polakiewicz is also quite interesting uh, on chat. I think everyone can see chat, is that right, Vasilis? And uh, about uh, the, the, the compatibility of uh, the clauses that the EU might be suggesting with international law and whether they constitute lex specialis. But uh, anyway, briefly, uh, Christina and then Lorenzo, so we can conclude and let the other panel also continue this very interesting discussion. Go on, Christina. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Just uh, very briefly, uh, if I may, about opinion 117, which was, which was mentioned earlier by Vasilis Pergantis. Um, Vasilis used the term generous. I don't know to what extent he really believes that the court was generous in opinion 117, because it wasn't, in my opinion, the court was not generous at all. And I think it is misleading to read or try to read opinion 213 uh, in light of opinion 117, because what the court did, in my view, obviously, uh, in opinion 117 was to limit as much as possible the role of this uh, arbitral tribunal uh, and so if we have to uh, accept and to define an international agreement compatible just to restricting as much as possible the role of an, an arbitral tribunal well this is fine as I try to explain in my presentation this is fine I believe as long as it concerns an arbitral tribunal, just for the nature of the tribunal as such. But when it comes to proper administration of justice, as you will see this once again, um, explaining your presentation, I think that I see there a problem for the European Court of Human Rights. And I would also like this to remain a problem in the sense that I do not believe that the principle of autonomy should be stretched as much as to undermine the role of another relevant European uh, regional international uh, court. Um, and also, if I may, in opinion 213, uh, um, the court stretched already too much the application of the principle of autonomy. Therefore, some limits I do believe should be identified because it, it is true that the principle of autonomy is essential. For example, I do believe that it is very important in ACMEA and I think that the reasoning of the court was uh, uh, correct, but ACMEA is different from opinion 117 and opinion 117 is different than 213. So essentially what I want to say is that uh, the principle of autonomy should be limited when it comes to the role of the Strasbourg court. And then if I may say the very last thing about something that Vasilis uh, mentioned, uh, it seemed to me that you were somehow concerned about um, in the new uh, draft or the discussion for the new draft uh, agreement about the, the role and the coordination between the EU and the member states. 
Well, in my understanding, this is not a concern or I would not really see as a relevant concern. Probably something that we may take into consideration in the general discussion, but not really concern because we have there the powerful uh, uh, principle of loyal cooperation, Article 4, Paragraph 3, and there we, we have a rich case law of the Court of Justice. So probably if we think about the, then the procedure would be time consuming, therefore bringing a case in Luxembourg before the court, before proceeding in Strasbourg, then I agree. It would be time consuming, there would be a delay. But in terms of coordination, <laughs> I would not be con concerned. I I'm, I'm really concerned about this uh, broad idea of European exceptionalism. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Lorenzo, uh, if you have any reactions, but please be yes. very brief. We're really okay, going so over time. Uh, I think the main difference uh, between one uh, proceduralizations and what would be uh, dual attribution is actually it's a dual attribution. It's like the fact that both subjects will be, the owner will be attributed. And I think that this comes directly from the simple application of the articles on the responsibility of the organizations and the article responsibility of states. That's it. That's the main uh, in one sentence. If I have to be so brief, it's better like this. I stop. Thank you. Thank you. I do want to leave time. We do have another very interesting panel coming up. So uh, thank you to the panelists uh, and for this discussion, to all those who took part in it. I will now cede the floor to the organizers um, uh, for the next, I guess, and final panel. So over to you, Basilis. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pazardzis, for uh, accepting uh, such a in such a short notice also to chair uh, this uh, panel and uh, to my colleagues. Now, uh, let me very uh, immediately pass to uh, Professor